The good thing about preachers and their children is that we get to talk about them from the pulpit. Amen, right? Usually I pick on our, old, our oldest son, uh, Paul, because there's a lot to talk about with him. But today I want to talk about our eldest daughter, uh, Julia. She's a member here, of course, raising three uh, godly children with her husband, Mauricio. The thing I want to say about her is that she had a hard time in school. This uh, daughter was the type of student in high school that didn't you know, test very well. You know, your teachers, you have those students, they don't test very well. I mean, she'd do great on the assignments. She would keep a detailed notebook, pay attention in class. She was all about it. But when the exam came, she became so nervous that sometimes she would almost be physically ill. So I see the teachers out there nodding their heads. Yep, yep. She thought that math tests were stressful. Now she has Gabriel, yeah. <laughs> See, I'm already starting to talk about the grandkids. I've got material you know, for, for a long time here. The point of this, thank you, Gabriel. <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of people like Julia, stressed out over tests, because along with the test, and here's the point, along with the test comes the possibility of failure. That's the thing. It's not the test we're afraid of, it's the failure we're afraid of. And failure at a test or anything else in life can be very painful emotionally, can be very costly or very inconvenient at times. I mean, just think, you go in for your driver's test and fail that, how inconvenient that is. However, as many of you know, failure can also be a great teacher a teacher of lessons that we are not always able to learn in other ways. Of course, I'm not promoting failure as an educational tool, but I do want us to be aware of some of the important things that our failures can teach us. For that reason, I'd like us to look at an episode of failure in one man's life that taught him many things and continues to instruct us even to this day. Let's briefly examine an incident in the life of Aaron, Moses' brother, and see what failure can teach us today. So open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. We'll be reading from that passage, Exodus 32. Before we look at Aaron's failure, I want to give a little background on this man, just in case. We know that Aaron was Moses' older brother, Exodus 4, verse 14, and that he was appointed at first to be Moses' spokesman to the Israelites in Egypt and before the Pharaoh. Moses was reluctant to speak, and so God gave Aaron the task of speaking on Moses' behalf. We read about that in Exodus chapter 4, verse 28. We also know that Aaron and his sons were later selected by God to serve as priests in the ministry of the tabernacle while the Jews wandered in the desert. He was at Moses' side for most of their time in the desert, and was, except for one time when he and Moses' sister Miriam criticized Moses' leadership, but aside from that time, Aaron was Moses' right-hand man. Like Moses, Aaron was not allowed to enter the promised land. He was told by God to pass on the priesthood to his son Eleazar, and he himself died at Mount Hor. It seems Aaron was greatly loved by the people and at his death they wept and mourned him for 30 days. Numbers chapter 20 verse 27 to 29. Aaron was a great servant of God and the first priest to serve the people as a whole. However, he was a man who experienced great failure in his life and in his ministry. And that brings us to chapter 32, let me set the scene. So the people have escaped Egypt, have left Egypt and have camped in the desert, the Israelites. 
God has provided their food and water in miraculous ways, given them manna and quail and water issuing from a rock. God has spoken to the people and their instruction in His laws and, and in His ways has begun. The people have been given instructions as to the system and the place of worship which Aaron and his sons are appointed to serve as priests. Everything is being laid out for them. There is great activity in preparing the tabernacle and the various elements that will be used in their worship. And during these things, during this period of activity, Moses is called up onto Mount Sinai to be given the laws for the people, the commandments that the Lord Himself will inscribe on the tablets of stone. Moses is gone for a period of time a period that the people find too long to wait. And it is during this time that Aaron fails in his leadership and in his priestly role. So let's begin reading Exodus chapter 32, shall we, in verse one. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, let us make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshiped it and have sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So note what happens here. The people are fidgety. That's not an Old Testament word, but it fits, the, it fits the situation. They're fidgety, they're restless. Their religion was the center of their lives and nothing was happening while Moses was gone. They wanted to have a religious feast, a religious activity, and they demanded that Aaron provide one for them. Now understand that the tabernacle and all the instruments for the sacrificial system of worship as well as the procedures for this have not yet been completed. But the people want to worship and celebrate now. They don't want to wait for Moses or the completion of God's place or God's method of worship. So Aaron, who was raised in Egypt, in Egyptian ways, tries to pacify a seeming revolt by giving in to their demands. Now remember, he is the spokesman, but Moses is the leader. God speaks and instructs Moses, not Aaron. He may not have known how to hurry up the completion of the work, but he knew who the leader was, and he knew enough to know that he should wait. And so what does he do? Aaron collects the gold and he produces a statue of a calf, which was in Egypt a symbol for fertility and prosperity. As far as pagan gods went, this was a creature, uh, excuse me, this was a creative and religious masterpiece, in no way meant to dishonor God. Look what we've done, it's made out of gold, pure gold. His intention was to quiet the people and give them a legitimate and satisfying worship experience. Doesn't that sound familiar? Of course, things go wrong very quickly. The people revert back to the pagan practices learned in Egypt, where they mix immoral activity with their religious festivals. The situation is degenerating as people go from idolatry 
to excesses and impure and indecent conduct. So let's keep reading what happens. Verse nine, it says, the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. The tablets were God's work and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a sound of war in the camp. But he said, it is not, it is not the sound of the city of triumph, nor is it the sound or the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So the scene, you know, it switches back to Moses on the mountain, who after being informed by God of his anger at the people because of their sins, he successfully pleads with God not to destroy them, and he rushes back to the camp. Keep reading, verse 19. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire, and ground it to powder, and scattered it over the surface of the water, and made the sons of Israel drink it. Then Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you, that you have brought such great sin upon them? Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn, you know the people yourself, that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> so Moses returns. He destroys the golden calf. He confronts his brother. Note how this great man, Aaron, note how this great man faced with this great failure doesn't even have the strength to own up to his own sin. His excuses are so lame. He says, well, you know, they forced me to do it. You know how they are. I mean, I use that tone of voice because that's the tone of voice. You know how they are. It's not my fault. I just threw the gold in the fire and boom, out came the calf. And this is my personal favorite here. You were gone and I had to do something. In other words, whose fault is it? It's your fault. You know, if you would have stayed, you know what I'm saying, if you would have stayed, none of this would have happened. And so because of his weakness and failure to stand up for what was right, we read further on that the people committed a great sin and they were punished for it. 3,000 men lost their lives that day as a countermeasure was begun to stop the spread of the religious rebellion. The people broke their covenant with God to be faithful and not worship idols. The result, of course, was guilt and shame, which is always the result when anyone sins, whether it's an individual or a nation. And Aaron's repentance and standing before God and Moses and the people was seriously compromised. Hey, this was the chief religious leader. He, he's the one that everybody is looking towards for religious instruction and leadership. Nice way to begin your ministry. 
He was the chosen one to be a minister unto God for the people and he had disgraced himself with this terrible failure. Of course, we know that the story doesn't end here, right? Let's go to uh, Exodus um, chapter 40. Let me read there in a second. After this episode, the people rededicate themselves to the Lord and the work to complete the tabernacle and the equipment and the special priestly garments is renewed. Moses receives and passes on a new set of commandments and the people prepare to worship God according to His commands and purpose and design. So we fast forward to chapter 40 and we read of another important episode in Aaron's life. After all, after all is built, and set into place, the Bible says that the following instructions were given to Moses in chapter 40, verse 12. We read, God says, Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. You shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister as priest to me. You shall bring his sons and put tunics on them and you shall anoint them even as you have anointed their father that they may minister as priests to me and their anointing will qualify them for a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. Thus Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Think now for a second. This miserable failure of a man this person who had demonstrated how incompetent he was to do the very thing that he was called upon to do. I mean, he, he was called upon to just do this one thing. And the very first time that he is tested, he fails and fails miserably. This same man over whom these words were spoken by God himself became God's priest. the first one from whom all the generations of priests would follow. I mean, what a happy ending to a sad story of failure. His first time out, he fails, and yet God anoints him as priest nevertheless. Now at the start of my lesson, I told you that failure is a good teacher, and I've kind of reviewed very quickly Aaron's failure in order to highlight a few lessons that we can learn from his experience. So here are the, the failure lessons, the application if you wish. Lesson number one, even great people fail. Even people who always try to be perfect fail. Even A-types fail. Even people who have been given all the advantages fail. Aaron was chosen by God, given power and position, but this did not guarantee a life without failure. God can use us to serve Him not because we're great, but because He's great. You know, the A-types, the overachievers, those who've succeeded in many areas, you need to understand that you can fail and fail miserably. And when you do, you need to realize that God can still use you even after you failed because His love is greater than any of your past or future achievements or failures. Why? Because even great people fail. Lesson number two. Our failures are never forgotten, but they are forgiven. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Our failures are never forgotten, but they are forgiven. Poor Aaron, his failure to, is forever recorded in the Bible for all to see. Thousands of years later, his failure is the subject of this guy's sermon. <laughs> But Aaron could go on with his life and his ministry because God forgave him this stumble. You know, some people think that so long as they can remember their own or somebody else's mistakes, there's no real forgiveness. 
Aaron's story reminds us that we need to focus more on God's forgiveness instead of our failures if we wish to regain our confidence for the future as well as the ability and the desire to forgive other people. You know, if you don't forgive yourself, you're going to have a hard time forgiving other people. And I've always said, if God has forgiven you, then you can forgive yourself. If God hasn't forgiven you, well then you need to think about that. You can't forgive yourself. If you dwell mainly on your or someone else's failures, you will never succeed at forgiveness and you will never receive the healing that comes with forgiveness. Sometimes the solution to the problem, sometimes the solution to the relationship issue is simple forgiveness. It's not, well, let's talk it out. Well, no, but you said then, when you said, I said, and I thought you were saying this because no, but you were really saying that, and then I went away angry. Blah, 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 blah. Sometimes the offense becomes so complicated and complex that the only thing to do is to forgive. The Bible says it is to a man's glory to overlook an offense. You know, the Bible says, uh, if your brother offends you, if your brother sins against you, you know, go to your brother. And sometimes we think that's the only option, but that's not the only option. Sometimes, instead of going to your brother, how about just turn the other cheek? How about that response? Lesson number three. Failure lays the groundwork for improvement. Aaron learned a hard lesson from the episode with the golden calf. It was a lesson that prepared him for the rigorous ministry of the priesthood. His failure improved his capacity for understanding and compassion. Despite the splendor of the tabernacle and the divine mysteries of the sacrificial system, aside from the beauty and the commanding presence of the priestly garments, Aaron never lost sight of the fact that like people he represented, he too was only a frail human being in need of God's mercy. If there's one thing all of us have in common is that we are all frail human beings in need of God's mercy and one another's forgiveness. This lesson had been indelibly stamped on Aaron's heart through failure and he was a more effective minister because of it. From start to finish the Bible tells and retells the story of man's continual failure in keeping God's commands. It also recounts God's continued effort at forgiving and restoring a failed humanity. This should give us confidence to approach Him the next time we think we failed too badly to ask for forgiveness. In order to ask Him to be our Lord and we His sons and daughters or to be His ministers again. So if you failed, if you failed badly and often, Take my message to heart today. Let God forgive you these things and let Him show you how to build a glorious life built on your forgiven past. Won't you let God, the God of love and mercy into your heart through repentance and baptism or through a sincere restoration today? If that is what you need, then we encourage you to come forward now to the God of mercy as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.